Turn in your Bibles to Luke, the 17th chapter. And I ask you to take Brother Dickens' prayer request for his knee very seriously, about his knee and about uh, his job. Just, how many of you hold up your hands and say, I'm going to pray for him every day this week? Praise God. Praise God. And remember the rest of, them, the rest of these folks on the prayer list. And, you know, let's remember this week and every week that we are Christians. Praise the Lord. What a privilege. But, you know, to go through life and be a light, be an encourager. You know, this week we're going to meet people who are troubled. We're going to, we're going to uh, meet people who have serious problems in their life. They may, it may be a cashier. It may be uh, a stock person in a store. It may be someone that we just run into in a store. But we can encourage them, if nothing else, with a smile. Let's just, let's just be encouragers, okay? And be nice to people. Just be nice. I like nice people. You know what? Nice people bless me. I just appreciate folks that are nice to me. And so let's just be nice to people. Luke 17. And I want to read verses 30 here down through verse 32. Luke 17, beginning with verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we come into thy presence tonight. And Lord, we do want to praise Thee. We do want to thank Thee again, Lord. We want to do that every service and every day. We just glorify Thy precious name. We've just appreciated the testimonies tonight. And Lord, we just ask You tonight that You will just uh, be with this service, that it'll be what Thou dost want it to be. Father, we need Thy blessing upon us. And we pray for Thy blessing, for we realize that we can accomplish nothing unless thou dost bless us. And we want to accomplish great things for thee. Just use us every day and use us more and more to accomplish thy work. Now, help us that we can pray for people. Help us, Lord, that we can be prayer warriors. Help us to pray for our country. And Lord, uh, for our churches. And Lord, we ask you just to help us to be witnesses and soul winners for thee, that multitudes of people can be saved. Now, be with the missionaries around the world. Be with us here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to preach on the subject, the housetop. I've been preaching a series of sermons, or I started a series of sermons before Christmas, on why the rapture of the church is after the middle of the tribulation. I stopped for Christmas, and we took time, as I said this morning, to uh, preach messages about uh, the birth of Christ, because that's so important. All right, But I want to continue that. Some, might, some people might call this the mid-tribulation rapture or the pre-wrath. It's been called by some the pre-wrath rapture. And in the last message, I spoke about the two signs Jesus gave about his coming. He told the church in Thessalonica uh, about the day of Christ. He talked about our gathering together unto him. And then he gave two signs there and said that uh, these things were, were going to take place before that day could come. He said, first of all, there would be a falling away. We, we call it sometimes the great falling away. That there would be a time when people would not hear sound doctrine, and a time when people would turn away from the Christian faith. And secondly, that the Antichrist, he calls him the son of perdition, the, excuse me, the Antichrist would be revealed, and uh, we believe that to be by going into the temple and proclaiming himself to be God. And these are the same signs that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24 and in Mark 13 and along the same line in Luke 21. The text that I have read in Luke 17 gives another indication, and that's what I'm wanting to preach on tonight that the rapture will, occur, will not occur, I should say, in, until after these uh, two signs have occurred. Jesus taught that the rapture would occur 
at the same time that people are leaving Jerusalem and that the Antichrist goes into the temple and proclaims himself to be God. And so now we have three indications. If I'm right in what I read here and what I study, we have three indications that the Bible gives us things that we can look for. First of all, that the rapture will occur after the falling away and after the Antichrist has gone into the temple. And third, when people are fleeing Jerusalem and at the time of what the Bible calls Jacob's trouble. Now again, when I preach on the second coming of Christ, I'm not trying to set dates. I'm trying to preach about circumstances because in Mark 13, 32, and that's the verse that I think we need to keep in mind, it says, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, not the Son, neither the Son, no, but only the Father. Only the Father knows at the, the exact time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I don't know the date. I don't think it's right to set dates. But Jesus said to watch. And so what we can do is we can look at the circumstances and Jesus did instruct us to watch. Did he not? Amen? It is something we are to know something about. The coming of Christ is, is, is important. Prophecy in the Bible is important. Folks, we need to know about the plan of salvation. We need to know how to tell somebody how to get saved. We need to know how to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. But we also need to, to study and, and know about the meat of the word. We need to know about the prophecy that the Bible talks about. And so I'm going to preach on this subject, uh, subject tonight, uh, the housetop. I'm going to preach about prophecy, the prophecy of the coming of Christ. First of all, Jesus spoke of both Jews and the church in Luke 17. Let me take you to verses 26 through 30. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the, coming, in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man revealed. Now there's something here I want us to, I want us to see. Jesus said that just before he comes there will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Now, he doesn't specify here when he talks about drinking that it's alcoholic beverages, but I believe that it is because I believe that it goes along with what he's talking about here, partying and revelry and, and, and gluttony and the things that he's talking about here. Folks, let me tell you, I, I talk to people who say, well, you know, you can't take the Bible and prove that it's a sin to drink my, well, listen, when, when the Lord gives drinking as one of the signs of the last days, and it's not a good sign when he gives it one of the signs of the last days, that ought to be enough. That ought to be enough for people to understand that, you know, that, that the church ought to be preaching and teaching about holiness and encouraging people not to drink and not, and not to do the things that the Bible talks about that sin. That's just free. I just had to throw that in because I think people need to think about that because, as I said the other night, more and more churches uh, believe it's okay to social drink today. Churches didn't used to believe that. Protestant churches didn't used to believe that. Most Protestant churches used to stand strong against drinking. And today they don't stand as strong as they should. Folks, we ought to continue to stand and we ought to stand stronger as the day approaches us. As I said, that's free. This chapter in Luke, here in Luke 17, is different from other prophecies. And I'm going to kind of take my time and go through this tonight. Matthew 24 is the great prophecy of the tribulation period and the coming of Christ and, and the one and, and Mark 13 corresponds to it. Luke 21's a little different. <clears throat> but they all they are all given at the same time. They are given at a time just before, about two days before Jesus went to the cross. Jesus spoke to his disciples and outlined these events summarized these events and he was there in the temple. This took place in the temple. That's what, that's what brought this, this about because the disciples showed him the temple. They were so proud of the temple and Jesus said, you know, there's not going to be one stone left upon another. You don't, need, you know, don't be proud of these things. Be, be glad you're saved. Be glad you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. 
This was in the temple. Matthew 24, uh, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Luke 17 is given probably while Jesus was in Samaria before these other chapters. And definitely before Jesus came to Jerusalem for his last Passover. The prophecies were given at two different times and two different locations. I think that's important for us to understand. Matthew 24 is a summary of the whole tribulation period. And it talks about uh, the coming of Christ. And I believe it does talk about the rapture of the church. Some people say that those, those chapters don't, but I believe that they do. And in Luke 17... As we look at Luke 17, it's different. It's, it's close and speaks of the same subject matter. But when we look at Luke 17, we find that as Matthew 24 gave a summary of the whole tribulation period, we find Luke 17 talks specifically about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the rapture of the church. The Bible teaches that there would be, you know, that there was a first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just celebrated Christmas. We don't know the day. We don't know the, the exact time of Christ's birth, but that's the day we set aside. We celebrated the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came into the world as a little baby and he lived his life, a perfect life, and he went to the cross, died on the cross, and rose from the grave and ascended back to heaven. The Bible also teaches there's a second advent. When Jesus Christ is going to come to the earth, and set his feet upon the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives is going to cleave in the midst, and Jesus Christ is going to set up his kingdom. The Bible says there are these two advents. The first advent when Jesus came as a little baby. The second advent when he will come at the end of the tribulation period. There's also the rapture of the church. And a lot of people don't see this. There's some churches who don't teach this. I, I don't understand why. If they want to argue about when the rapture is going to be, none of us know when Christ is coming. But my friends, let tell me tell you, the Bible does say Jesus is coming for his church. It doesn't use the word rapture. Rapture means caught up. And the Bible does use the term caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. That we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in there. Let me tell you something. It's certain that there is a rapture. And we need to be ready. Boy, that's, this, you know, when we look at, when we look at the, the things the Bible talks about, you know, we don't, it's not, it's, it's important for us to not only just be Christians, we need to be strong Christians. We need to be mature Christians. And by the way, we need to be faithful Christians. Everybody say amen. amen. Faithful to the Lord. Faithful to, faithful to, uh, to, to the teachings of the word of God, faithful to our church. We need to be faithful Christians. Faithful in God's work. Spiritual, uh, spiritually mature people. In Luke 17, Jesus speaks of two very important men. He speaks of Noah and Lot. Matthew 24 and Mark 13, for you who study prophecy, you know when I'm talking about Matthew 24 and Mark 13, both of those speak of Noah. But they do not speak of Lot. But here in this, in this scripture in Luke, 20, in Luke, and, and, and Luke 21 does not speak of Noah or Lot, it just gives the circumstances. But here in Luke 17, the, you know, Jesus talked about both of these men and he gave, he gave them as indications of what the world's going to be like at the, I believe at the rapture of the church. Noah represents the church being taken out of the world. By the way, the, Noah, the, the name Noah means rest. Praise God, the Lord's going to come and get his church. You see, he's not going to come all the way to the ground. There's going to be a time that the Lord is going to come and the church and there's going to be a resurrection and the, and, and, and the, the, the saints who are dead, who have died and, and who, who are there uh, have gone on to meet the Lord. The, the, the Bible says there's going to be a resurrection and they're going to up to meet the Lord first and those who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. So the church is going out of this world. Jesus will come part way and the church will go up. That's what a Christian wedding is supposed to be. The husband here at the altar and the wife comes down or the, the bride comes down the aisle. 
I, I, I try, to, try to preach that often because I think people need to understand the bride's dressed in white because it represents righteousness and the, and the, uh, the, the groom is here who represents the Lord Jesus Christ who has come part way down. The, the bride comes up. They meet here at the altar. Folks, that's what it's going to be whenever Jesus comes. Hallelujah. We're going to meet him in the air and we're going to go to heaven with him. I'm looking forward to that. A lot of folks in heaven I want to see. I want to talk to Abraham. I want to sit down and ask him some questions. And a lot of other folks. Noah represents the church being taken out of this world. Think of the flood. And eight people who were saved. Noah and his family were in the ark. Uh, the flood represents the wrath of God because when Noah got on the ark and, and the Lord sent, uh, and he shut the door, and God shut the door, and when Noah got on the ark and God shut the door, it began to rain, and the Lord sent a flood upon the earth that killed every living thing. And so that represents, it, well, it didn't represent the wrath of God back then, it was the wrath of God. So as we look at Noah, and Jesus said as it was, in the days of Noah. He uses Noah here as a representative. Now I don't believe the church will be here. And you know in the book of Revelation. When you study the tribulation period. Uh, I believe it's chapter 16. We come to the seven vials of the wrath of God. And you start out there. And, and you see that it starts out with uh, uh, sores. On people who receive the mark of the beast. And it ends up with, and it ends up those seven uh, vials of wrath are poured out. And the last vial is the battle of Armageddon. And so God is going to judge the world. The wrath of God is going to fall upon the world. But we're not going to be there. The church is not going to be here. That's why it's called the pre-wrath rapture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9. But God hath not appointed us to wrath. But to, obtain, to, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the Bible tells us that Noah is the eighth person. I believe it's saying that he's one of the eight. There were eight people that got on the ark and eight people that God delivered. What I'm trying to say tonight is Jesus talked about Noah as a representative of what's going to happen when he comes for his church. Noah was a type of the church. And then he talked about Lot. Here in Luke 17, he didn't talk about it in Matthew 24. He didn't, he didn't mention Lot. Luke, uh, Mark 13, he didn't mention Lot. But here in, in, in Luke 17, he does. Lot represents the Jews. Lot left Sodom and Gomorrah before the wrath of God. You remember when he was in Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels had to take his arm and they had to lead him out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And his wife got out and she turned around and she looked back and she became a pillar of salt. And so, but you know, Lot didn't leave the world. And just as soon as Lot, you know, the angel said, you've got a leader. Well, I can't, we can't do anything until you're gone. We can't do anything as long as you're here. We're getting ready to destroy this place, but we can't destroy it as long as you're here. And so they led Lot out, but Lot didn't leave the world. Lot went up on the, went into the mountains. You see, not, Noah left the world. He's a representative of the church. Lot didn't leave the world. He, 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 he went up to the mountains. And so I believe Jesus is using Lot here as a representative of the Jewish people during the tribulation period. Now, if this is true, we have the church in heaven during the wrath of God, the last part of the tribulation period. I believe we're going to see, I believe we're going to see the treaty signed, the covenant. That's kind of scary to think about. I believe we're going to be here during the first half of the tribulation period. I believe we're going to see the Antichrist go in. Uh, at least we're going to know about the Antichrist go into the temple of God. Those are the signs that the Apostle Paul talked about. I believe the church is going to be here through that period of time. But folks, let me tell you, just a little after the middle, before the wrath of God falls upon the world, Jesus is coming for his church. We're leaving here. Amen. But you see, God is going to begin to work with the Jewish people. He set them aside so we could be saved. They rejected Jesus Christ, their Messiah. And God set them aside and he works with his church today. But you see, 
during the, the middle, the, the, the last part of the tribulation, he's going to begin to work with them so he can bring them back and he can restore them to fellowship and they are going to be his people through the millennium. So you have the church in heaven and you have the Jews, God's earthly people on earth. Now it's important that we understand that this agrees. Jesus preached this. Paul preached this. He, they, they both gave the same signs. The church will see the Antichrist revealed. But the church will not be here for the wrath of God. I think that's so important. Folks, that first sign. A time when the love of many shall wax cold that Jesus talked about. And Paul called it a falling away. I believe we're in it today. I believe that's happening I believe, we're, I believe we're seeing it. I don't know how far along we are in it. I believe we, I think it's going to, we, I talked to a man about that the other day. And uh, a, a godly man, a Christian man, he, and he brought it up and he said, Pastor, he said, don't you think we're in the falling away? And I said, yes, I do. He said, I think it's going to get worse, don't you? I said, yes, it's going to get a lot worse. But folks, let me tell you, we're seeing the sign that the apostle Paul, taught. we are in the falling away. It's not 20 years from today. It's today. People are falling away. People are turning away from sound, from sound doctrine. Uh, there's a lot of churches. Like Laodicea. I, I, we live in a time where the church of Laodicea is rich, materially rich. How, how, how much richer can the church get? Our little old church, we have, we have a projector. Man, I can, take, I, can take a, I can take a piece of paper, I can walk in there to the, to the copy room, put that paper in there, punch that thing out, and, 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 and get you a hundred copies in just, just a little while of, of any kind of, uh, kind of paper we want to print. Most of us have cars. Most of us have two cars. Most of us, most of us eat all we want to. Most of us do what we want to. How much, how much richer can the church be? We're in the Laodicean age. We're in the falling away. And in that time, and praise God, by the way, there's still Philadelphian churches, good churches, Bible-believing churches. And I believe there will be right up to the time Jesus comes. I want to be in a good church. I believe it's so important today that people use discernment and prayer to pick out a good church. They need a, <laughs> they need a church that preaches the Bible. They need a church that preaches the King James Bible. They need a pastor that's not afraid to stand up and preach about salvation. They need, they need a church where, where, where people believe in holiness. They need a church where people believe in soul winning. And by the way, fellowship for Christians is by the blood of Jesus Christ and by the blood of Jesus Christ only. There's only one way to heaven. I believe there's Philadelphia churches today. Good churches, Bible-believing churches. But we're in the falling way. And that's why we ought to hang on to our King James Bible. You know, modern, modern scholars are changing the Bible. I wrote this down faster than spe the speed of sound. Modern versions are telling people Jesus is not God. They're, taking, they're, they're, they're detracting from the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There's one Bible that mentions God as a she today. That's blasphemy. God is not a she, God is a he. The Bible tells us so. They're, they're weakening the doctrine of hell. Let me tell you, as I preached this morning, and Brother Dickens preached on it last Sunday night, there is a hell, there's a real hell. People need to get saved so they can go to heaven. Eating and drinking, as I said, alcohol everywhere. Drugs everywhere. Giving in marriage. You know, if this is not the beginning of the falling away, what's it going to be like? You know, we, we've got spiritual eyes. These are the things that the Bible talks about. It's time to be serious about serving the Lord. I believe that's, what, that's why Jesus said, watch. He wants, he wants Christians, people, to surrender their life to Christ and be serious about serving the Lord. Are you serious about serving Christ tonight? You know, it's not just a matter of coming to the altar and praying. That's important. That's, you know, it's, it, it's, an, it, it's a necessity to be born again. 
But I, uh, you know, and I talked about that again in Sunday school this morning, what the word faith means, what's the word believe means. And, and it's a, it, it may start small, but it grows and it continues. It's important that we give our life to Christ and we live for the Lord Jesus Christ and we're ready when he comes. We need to be strong Christians. Are you a strong Christian? Are you faithful to the Lord? Secondly, Jesus used the housetop to teach the circumstances of the rapture. Let me take you to verses 30 through 32. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to, let, to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. The circumstances of the housetop is on all three of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke doesn't mention the housetop, but it's there where Jesus gave this prophecy. And this is the time when Jerusalem is under siege. Turn with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And let me begin reading there in verse 15 down through verse 18. Matthew 24, I want you to see this. Matthew 24, verses 15 down through verse 18. Listen carefully. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, Whosoever re whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let, them which is on the, let, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Jesus linked the housetop with the abomination of desolation. You see, Jesus, and, and a lot of people look at this and say, well, Daniel talked about the abomination of desolation. There's, you know, so it happened during the time of Daniel. No, Jesus picked this up. There was an abomination that, that took place. Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed a sow on the altar. That's abomination in the temple. But Jesus picked this up and he said, no, that, that's a partial fulfillment because he pointed forward. He said, there's going to be another abomination of desolation. And so he gives the circumstance here in Matthew 21, verses 20 through 20, the circumstances are the same. Jesus came in Luke 17. So what I'm saying is when you, leave, when you read Matthew 24, when you read Mark 13, and when you read Luke 21, if you compare the circumstances and the scenario there that Jesus gave of the tribulation period and you come back to Luke 17, it's like a blueprint. It's like Jesus cuts into the middle of the, 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 abomination, the time of the abomination of desolation and pulls that picture out and, 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 and makes it larger so we can look at it. And so he takes Luke 17 here and he takes time to tell us what, the circumstances of, the, of, his, of his rapture, the rapture of the church. See, people on the, are on the housetop at the abomination of desolation. And the scripture that I have just read, a moment, Luke 17, 30 through 32, makes it plain. This is when the rapture occurs. Let me read it again, verses 30 through 32. Luke 17, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day he which shall be upon the housetop, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away, and he that is in the field, let him likewise not return. Remember Lot's wife. You see, he's talking about a time here when something awful is going to happen in Israel. He talks about the abomination of desolation. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the apostle Paul said the man of sin was going to to proclaim himself to be God. And we understand that, that he's going in, that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us he's going into the temple and he's going to say that he is God. Well, folks, there's not a temple right there now, but the Bible tells us that the Antichrist is going into a temple and proclaiming himself God. So we know if the Lord says the Antichrist is going into the temple proclaiming himself God, there's going to be a temple built. There has to be a temple built. And the Antichrist is going in and proclaiming himself to be God. Now that's a time 
And when we talk about Bible prophecy, it talks about a world government. I, there's a world government forming today. In fact, it's in place. Everything's about the world. It, uh, there's a time when, when, the, when there's going to be world trade. There's world trade today. Listen, we're not only in the time, we're not only in the time of the great falling away. We can see that happening before our eyes, but we're seeing a lot of the things that the Bible talks about. We're seeing the formation of those things. Today there's a world there's going to be a world religion. There's a world religion forming today. Jesus used this time and to and to teach that it's the time when People are on the house. You see, he said that those who are in Judea should flee to the mountains. Who's in Judea? Mostly Jews. Mostly Jews. So we know the Lord is talking. He used Lot here for an example of, of, of his people, of his earthly people. Lot was uh, taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the, the wrath of God came. And Lot didn't leave the world. Lot went up to the mountains. Jesus used Lot as a representative of the Jewish people. But, but Noah, he used Noah as a representative of the rapture of the church because when, when Noah got on the ark, the ark was lifted up. Him and his family went up over the world and they didn't come back until, until the flood was all over. They escaped the wrath of God by leaving the world. Jesus used Noah as a representative that of the church. The church is going to be raptured. And then he said a very important thing. Remember Lot's wife. Folks, are you ready to leave? I don't know the time of Christ coming, but I see that when Jesus talked about the housetop, I would encourage you to pray about that, to study that. I don't know the time of Christ coming, but I know it's the most important thing to the church that there is today. And we need to know about it. Amen? Amen? I encourage you to stay. And you know, when Jesus said, when you're up on the housetop, to me he's saying two things are going to happen. The Jews, when they see Jerusalem are, are surrounded with armies, it's time to get out. It's a time of great trouble, great tribulation. It's time for the Jews to leave. But it's time for Christians to get ready because the Lord's going to come. The last thing, Jesus taught that Luke 17 is about the rapture of the church. Look at Luke 17, 34. And let me read down through verse 36. I tell you in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding together. The one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now, I don't know how anyone can doubt that that's the rapture of the church. One's going to be left. Two men, grind, two men working in the field together. One's going to be left. The one who's not saved, the one who's lost, is not ready to go to heaven. The one who's lost when Jesus comes in the air, the, the, he's, going to be, he's going to be left. And the other one's going to be taken up in the air to meet the Lord in the air. Two women grinding at the meal. There will be two women work. Put it as a factory if you want to. Two women working in a factory. Two women washing dishes together. Whatever they're going to do. The one has not given her heart to Christ. The one is, the one is lost and, and has not accepted Christ as her Savior. She's going to be left when Jesus comes. The other person's going to go up to meet the Lord and be forever with the Lord. That's the rapture of the church. You know, there's a, there's a difference here between Noah and Lot that I think we need to I think we need to get a hold of. Three times Jesus said the one shall be taken and the other left. I want to be ready. But I want you to notice the big, big difference between Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was perfect in his generations, the Bible tells us. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We're saved by grace. But when it, came, when it came time to get on the ark, Noah's family got on the ark with him. Praise God. It's, you know, we need our family to be saved. Now, you can't make people get saved. 
I'm not advocating that. But I am advocating we pray for them. I am advocating, folks, that we, that we witness to them when, when, they, when they will let us and when we can. But listen, I don't know when the coming of Christ, it could be tomorrow. I may be wrong here. But it's so important that we understand that, folks, let me tell you, we need, we need those who are closest to us, we need them to get saved. Amen? And, folks, let me tell you, we need our neighbors to get saved, too. And we need, we need everyone that we can contact, everyone we can reach. I want people to go to heaven. I just love to get to heaven, and I'd like to walk down the street, and I'd like to see, I'd like to see this whole crowd there. I'd like to see multitudes of other people who came to Gethsemane Church and got saved. I'd like to see multitudes of people that we led to the Lord down the street. I want to see heaven full. But old Lot, Lot was a righteous man. Think about that. The Bible says that Lot was a righteous man, a just man. He was a godly man. But he was different than Noah. Because when he left Sodom, he didn't take all of his family. He had some sons-in-laws there. His wife was so involved with the world that even though the angel had said, don't look back, she got up there, she turned and she looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. And then Lot went on the mountain and everybody knows the bad things that happened there on that mountain. You see, Lot himself was saved. But he didn't take his family with him. He left at least part of his family. And the other part of his family didn't live right. You see the difference? Oh, folks, let me tell you. You know, heaven's too good to miss. I was thinking before the message, I've only... Well, I've got to visit Washington, D.C. many years ago, just briefly for part of a day, and then we were there not too awful long ago. We got to spend a day or so there in Washington, D.C. I've never been inside the Washington Monument. I've seen it. Both times it was una I was unable to get inside of it. But I told Sister Noyes the last time we were there, I said, one thing we've got to see again is the Lincoln Memorial. I tell you to walk up there and to stand inside the Lincoln Memorial and to see the statue of Abraham Lincoln and to read his speeches engraved there on the wall will make you proud to be an American. I mean, it'll just, if, there, if there's anything in you at all about America, it'll just swell up inside of you. It's just almost like being on holy ground. It's just something to see. And I told Sister Noyes, I said, let me tell you something. We got to see, we got to see the Lincoln Memorial because it's something we don't want to miss. Heaven's something I don't want to miss. I don't know the exact time the Lord's coming. Some say it's pre-trib. I hope they're right. Except for some folks being lost and some souls I want to see saved and some business I want to take care of. And if the Lord wants to set that aside and come, praise God, let Him come. Amen? Amen. If He'd come tonight, we could just all go up to heaven with Him and get out of this place. It'd be grand. But there's some people that aren't going to make it. And heaven's too good to miss. Where are you tonight? Where are you with God tonight? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? Are you growing in the Lord every day? Are you living the way the Lord... You see, you don't have to answer this preacher. You don't even have to answer this church. I think it's good. I think the Bible teaches people ought to to be in a good Bible-believing church and submit themselves to the church and be responsible to that church. A lot of people just don't want to be responsible to the church. They just want to, they want to just 
dictate to the church. They don't want to hear the preaching and teaching of God's Word. I think the Bible teaches Christians need to be responsible to the Lord and responsible to, responsible to the Lord first and responsible to the, to the church second. Amen? Amen? But you see, you don't have to be, it's not this church that's going to judge you. It's not this preacher that's going to do the judging. But Jesus is. Are you ready tonight? That's the important thing. That's always the important thing about the coming of Christ. That we're ready. I, I know people argue over whether uh, theology and, and argue over. And I, I've discussed things with people. But you see, the important thing is are we ready right now? Not were we ready 10 years ago. Are we ready right now? Not are we going to be ready 15 years from today. But are we ready right now?